daughter is out there in the back. She really wanted to be around her her daddy today. Uh, so here we're going live. Uh, right now I'm teaching both Bio 201, which is Southern Molecular Biology, and Bio 123, which is the Biology for Health-Related Sciences. Now, Bio 123, we've been talking a lot about GMOs, and we're going to start talking about climate change this week. And in Bio 201, we've been talking about um, – cellular respiration, and we've been talking about photosynthesis. Now, I want to start with cellular respiration for one. Uh, you know, you start throwing in chemical equations and people just are like, no, I don't like the chemistry. I like the cell biology part better. And uh, even a couple of students have, have actually said, you know, I don't just like this chemistry that much. I like this the cell part better. Well, you know, fair enough. I mean, everybody likes different things. Uh, we all have our, our own interests. So why do I teach, you know, some chemistry like that at that level? Well, for several reasons, you know, one, it's really important to learn, you know, how the Krebs cycle works. And to me, it's, it's utterly fascinating to know that we can understand in such a detail where each chemical reaction is happening, what the molecules look like, how fast it's occurring, and where those carbons are actually bonding to each other. That, to me, is just utterly fascinating. And, you know, some people do like biochemistry, and every now and then when you teach something like the Krebs cycle, you really spark interest in that type of biology and understanding how our body works and our cells work at that fundamental level at, down at the, at the level of molecules. And to me, you know, sparking that, that interest is very important. And there's also uh, sometimes, you know, we also have to train for something this hard. We have to teach something this difficult not because I'm trying to uh, create a filter or anything in the class, but a lot of times as we as we go to school, we have to learn things that are difficult. Uh, we may never use it again in our life. Sometimes we might. Um, I never thought I'd see Krebs cycle again when I took it. And uh, here I am, you know, 25 years later, teaching it almost every semester of my life. But learning is also a much like exercise. If you want to train to uh, do well in, in your sport, whether it's basketball, football, baseball, cross country, track and field, skiing. You know, we all spend a lot of time training our body physically. Well, you know, we have to train our minds mentally as well. And one way we train our mind is by um, learning something difficult like cellular respiration. So let's start now. Let's see if we've got any questions coming in. <laughs> Got to watch Game of Thrones, but be back later. Oh, I know. I I thought when I was in class that uh, I knew I'd be competing against Game of Thrones, and uh, I'm pretty excited for that the episode. There's a great story in Inverse, I-N-V-E-R-S-E, talks about what they think is going to happen with Game of Thrones this weekend, and they compared it to one of my favorite TV shows of all time, Babylon 5. And I know that uh, Babylon 5 came out in the 90s. It seems a bit dated. The first season was Oh, man, it was uh, it was OK, but it turned out to be my favorite television show ever and the most epic sci fi I've ever seen. OK, let's see. Can you go over inputs and outputs for the four steps in cellular respiration? OK, unfortunately, I don't have my chalkboard with me for a couple of reasons. One, I'm in the middle of moving. We're going to move out in the next two weeks. And uh, these dry erasers, they are good for about a half a lesson and then they're done and I forgot to get a new one today. But I can still do it from memory here. Okay, inputs and outputs of the four steps in cellular respiration. So let's go over this slowly. Cellular respiration, step one, glycolysis. Step two is uh, pyruvate oxidation. Step three is Krebs cycle. Step four is oxidative phosphorylation. <clears throat> okay, and step one, glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm. We got a molecule of glucose comes in. And what we're going to get out of glycolysis is two pyruvates. Okay, that's a three carbon molecule. Two pyruvates, two NADHs, and two ATPs through substrate level phosphorylation. Now, when oxygen is present, pyruvate will be transported into the mitochondria. And then we will do pyruvate oxidation. I know some people call it pyruvate processing, and that's not a very good term for it. But pyruvate oxidation or pyruvate decarboxylation is a good term. And here's how this works. In pyruvate oxidation, we're going to get two carbon dioxides, and because we're oxidizing the pyruvate, 
We're also gonna get two NADHs. And then the remaining two carbons of the pyruvates, we're gonna get acetyl coenzyme A. So starting back with glycolysis, for every molecule of glucose we start with, at the end of pyruvate oxidation, we're gonna get two carbon dioxides, uh, two NADHs, and two acetyl coenzyme A's. And it's very important, ATP is not made in pyruvate oxidation. Next, we're gonna to go to Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle. This is where we're gonna oxidize those remaining carbons. And for every molecule of glucose that we began with in uh, the beginning of glycolysis, the Krebs cycle is gonna give us four CO2s. So all the CO2s, all the carbons now have been formed. It's also gonna give us six NADHs, two FADH2s, and it's also going to give us two more ATPs through substrate level phosphorylation. So after we've gone through glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, and the Krebs cycle, we now have a total of four ATP molecules all through substrate level phosphorylation. We have 10 NADHs, two FADH2s. Those are high energy electron carriers. And all the carbon has been oxidized. So we now have uh, six carbon dioxides. Now the fourth and final stage of cellular respiration is uh, oxidative phosphorylation. And that to me is one of the most remarkable things in all of biology. Now people like set numbers. The reality is with oxidative phosphorylation, the number of, um, of uh, ATPs made varies. There's a theoretical maximum of 34, but you'll never get 34 ATPs. You'll get more like 28 to low 30s. So when you talk about oxidative phosphorylation, you could just say like approximately 28 to 30 something. It doesn't have to be an exact number because in, in nature, it's not an exact number. Okay. Using the laws of thermodynamics, explain why all the chemical energy in a molecule of glucose cannot be converted solely to ATP. You know, that's a fantastic question because the laws of thermodynamics tell us that in a closed system, you can't create nor destroy energy. And what that also means in chemistry, that when you have a chemical reaction like cellular respiration, the amount of energy must be equal to what's in the reactants of you know, glucose and oxygen and the products, carbon dioxide and water, plus the energy that's released or transferred to other molecules. However, there is the second law of thermodynamics. And the second law of thermodynamics says, you know, every time we use energy, every time we transfer or transform energy, we're going to increase entropy. And some of the usable energy is going to be lost. So basically, you know, exergonic reactions a lot of times create heat. That's that's your increase in entropy. So there, because of the second law of thermodynamics, that increase in entropy, we can't be 100% efficient. You're going to lose some energy to your environment as you increase Entropy. Okay. Carolyn Heitman, can you review the differences between photosystem one and photosystem two? That's a really good question. Okay. First of all, uh, they're, they're labeled backwards. It's a function of how they discovered them. Photosystem one was discovered first, and then photosystem two was discovered second. However, when we talk about linear electron flow in photosystems and photosynthesis, the events in photosystem two come first. Basically what's gonna happen is light's gonna strike the, the antenna complex and so there's gonna be some enzymes and they're gonna strip the electrons and hydrogens away from the water molecule. And that's, that's remarkable, right? I mean, we're gonna oxidize oxygen. So that requires a fair amount of energy to do so. Then, because we ripped those electrons away from water and those electrons were in a lower energy state, they don't have a much, they don't have a lot of energy to do work. So what photosystem two is going to do, it's just going to, it's going to take the energy in sunlight and it's going to use that energy, not only to, to acquire the electrons from, you know, the, the water molecule, but to elevate them up in energy as well. And then a molecule called phaophyton is going to pull that electron away from photosystem two, and then it's going to go through um, a cytochrome complex, which is basically an electron transport chain. And the energy in those electrons are going to be used 
to create a proton gradient so we can make ATP through chemiosmosis. So that's photosystem two. Now, as the electrons flow through uh, the cytochrome complex, what happens is they lose energy, just like they lose energy during cellular respiration. So now we're gonna we're gonna have a small molecule called PC plastoquinin is going to um, I'm sorry plastocyanin is going to take those electrons and shuttle them to photosystem one. Now photosystem one is gonna reelevate those electrons back up in energy. And the reason why is because we need high energy electrons to reduce uh, carbon in the Calvin cycle. And if you remember in and when we talk about cellular respiration, I'm always like, hey, we're, we're using these high energy electrons to, uh, to power chemiosmosis. Well, you need high energy electrons to fix carbon into a carbohydrate. So then those high energy electrons from photosystem one are gonna be shuttled over and reduced to, uh, or reduced NADP to NADPH right, by NADP reductase, and then that's going to be going off to the Calvin cycle. So there you have it. Photosystem 2 is uh, using light energy to strip electrons away from oxygen and elevate those electrons and energy so you can run an electron transport chain to power a proton pumps to create an electrochemical gradient so you can make ATP through chemiosmosis. And then Photosystem 1 will uh, elevate those electrons again so that we can use them to reduce or, or inorganic carbon, basically um, carbo, or carbon dioxide to a carbohydrate. Okay, I'm gonna have a diet Mountain Dew break here for one second. Marcella, why does DNA have a double helix structure? You know, that's a fantastic question. And that's actually pretty complicated. But basically think of this, DNA has a sugar phosphate backbone that is more hydrophilic, more water loving than the interior, which includes these nitrogenous bases. They're, they're a little bit less hydrophilic. So those um, nitrogenous bases fold in toward each other and form hydrogen bonds and uh, they stack very nicely. And then on the outside, you have the sugar phosphate backbone formed by the other parts of the nucleotides. The reason why it twists around is to uh, maximize the distances between all the charges of those phosphate groups and hydroxyl groups, and it forms a very stable conformation. And in fact, DNA can actually undertake other types of conformation, but the double helix is one of the most common conformations because it's the most stable energetically. And that's important because, you know, DNA's major role is to store information. And whatever you're going to store your information for long term, you really want it to be um, as stable as possible. That's a fantastic question. And if you were to take a biochemistry class, I'll get way more into the kinetics of that. Okay. Explain how ice can have lower entropy than liquid water, even though no work was done to organize the water molecules in the ice. Yeah, that's a good one too. All right, let's get to that one. How does ice form? It's pretty amazing actually. You know, ice is a crystal. It's a repeating structure. And what happens is, you know, you have liquid water like my Mountain Dew. It's held together by hydrogen bonds, all this liquid in here. It's held together by hydrogen bonds. But this is about 35 degrees. So there's enough thermal energy that those hydrogen bonds are being broken and reformed, broken and reformed, broken and being reformed, but not broken enough that they form a gas. As water begins to freeze, we hit around 32 degrees, there is insufficient energy to break those hydrogen bonds. So what happens is that the hydrogen bonds become set. And once again, because water is a polar molecule, water molecules are going to form a repeating pattern to become as energetically stable as possible. And then water will form up to four or will form four hydrogen bonds with, um, with each other, with another water, with other water molecules. Now what happens is this, as it forms a stable structure, it forms a repeating structure, which actually is lower entropy. So ice is actually more structured than liquid water. But the reason why it doesn't violate the laws of thermodynamics is because every time a hydrogen bond forms, as your ice molecules start to form, as you're crystallizing, as your water molecules stick together and start to crystallize, those hydrogen bonds, when they form, they release energy to the environment. So laws of thermodynamics can't create or destroy energy. You can transfer it and transform it. 
So when ice begins to form, those hydrogen bonds forming release energy to the environment. And in fact, uh, we see this in the e if you ever live in the east, you know when it begins to do, the air temperature gets cold enough that what happens is the water molecules in the air start to condense out and form dew. And as you go from a, a, a liquid, I'm sorry, as you go from a gas to a liquid, hydrogen bonds form, it releases energy back to the atmosphere and your nighttime temperatures plummet and then they level off when you hit the dew point. And the same thing happens also as ice begins to freeze and form frost. So you're not violating any laws of thermodynamics, even though water is more um, lower entropy, is because you're increasing the entropy in the area around you as you release energy when those hydrogen bonds are being formed. I hope that wasn't too roundabout. Okay. Difference between substrate level phosphorylation and oxidative phosphorylation. That's a really good question. Okay. Substrate level. That tells me straight up, I've got an enzyme and my ATP and my phosphate group have to align with an enzyme and it's going to perform the duties of the endergonic reaction of sticking the phosphate onto the ATP. Now, in substrate level phosphorylation, because I'm using enzymes, that's an endergonic reaction that requires energy, about 7.3 kilocalories a mole to be precise. For substrate level phosphorylation to work, you have to have a source of energy. And the way our cells do this is they combine, they pair or couple an exergonic reaction with an endergonic reaction. So think about glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. These are exergonic reactions. We're, we're breaking down uh, a carbohydrate. This is releasing energy. So in substrate level phosphorylation, as we break down our carbohydrate, we're going to pair that reaction with substrate level phosphorylation the endergonic reaction where we use an enzyme to make ATP. Now, oxidative phosphorylation is a little bit different. In this case, we're using a large molecule called ATP synthase. Now, instead of combining an exergonic reaction with an endergonic reaction, in this case, we're going to use an electrochemical gradient created by an electron transport chain. And then what happens is every time you get 7.3 kilocalories a mole of energy stored up, as an electrochemical gradient, thank you, electron transport chain, the protons will push their way through ATP synthase and you'll make ATP. The beautiful part of uh, oxidative phosphorylation is that it's an incredibly efficient way of making ATP. And in fact, every cell on this planet uses an electron transport chain to create an electrochemical gradient, specifically a proton gradient, and uses chemiosmosis from that to, to make ATP. Okay. Jen Hester, why do some leaves turn yellow in the fall? You know, that goes back to our photosynthesis we're starting to learn right now. You know, plants are green because of chlorophyll. Now, the easy answer is, oh, plants reflect green. Well, you know, why do they reflect green? Well, it turns out that plants can't really use um, green light very well because of the specific energy states that electrons have to be in. But chlorophyll is only one pigment. We have accessory pigments as well, including uh, carotenoids and other ones that give plants either red, yellowish, or orangish looking colors. Now those carotenoids, they, they increase the color spectrum or the light spectrum that plants can absorb for energy, but they also are have antioxidant properties. They can protect uh, chlorophyll molecules from the free radicals that are formed by intense uh, ultraviolet light hitting those leaves. So carotenoids and these other yellow pigments, like I said, they're there to protect the leaf as well as expand the, uh, um, the range at which they can absorb light. But in the fall, a lot of plants will, they're going to lose their leaves because there's no point in trying to like keep them around when it gets really cold. And besides, you don't have as much light anyway, so your rate of photosynthesis will be really low. So they drop them in the fall. And as they start to reabsorb the nutrients, what happens is the chlorophyll is the first one to degrade. And once the chlorophyll goes away, you start to see all of the other colors, including the carotenoids, that make them look oranges. Okay. Bradley Lee, can you explain the significance of tax polymerase? Yeah, you know, that's a fantastic question. And I'm glad you brought that up. You know, in all of my classes, I, I, I try to put a plug in for why it's important to conserve biodiversity and why it's important for
for scientists to have a curious mind, right? I mean, you know, science is based on curiosity, understanding our world, and just asking questions. In the 1970s, okay, I'm going to go a little roundabout here. In the 1970s, you know, people thought that life could not live higher than about 140 degrees or so. So these microbiologists are wandering around Yellowstone, and they, they come up on a hot spring, and they're like, whoa, uh, it's like 170 degrees in there, and there's this prokaryote is surviving just fine. This blows away everything we, we know about what life is supposed to do. And so they called it Thermus Aquaticus. So if you look at TAC, T would be Thermus Aquaticus, AQ Aquaticus. Okay, now every living organism has to replicate its DNA. And we have something called a, a DNA polymerase that does that. Now our DNA polymerase is optimized for 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Now these prokaryotes are living in like 170 degree water. Their they're, uh, DNA polymerase survives just fine there. Mine would fall apart. You know, you being over every other animal on the planet, we would, we would denature. So what this guy realized was, wait a second, um, their, their DNA polymerase can survive in 170 degree water without denaturing? Hold on. At the time, Whenever you want to get a sequence of DNA, you want to figure out its A's, T's, G's, and C's. You want to know what the sequence is to make a gene like insulin or something like that. Well, you have to sequence that DNA. And one of the ways we sequence it is we use what is called a PCR, polymerase chain reaction, where we take a small sample of DNA and we amplify it. And the way we amplify it is we heat it up to pull the DNA, the two strands apart. Then we add a, a DNA polymerase to, to duplicate it. And what these guys realize all of a sudden is that the TAC polymerase works at a higher temperature. So we can do a PCR automated where you can run it up, it denatures the DNA, but not the TAC polymerase. So we can start replicating your DNA. So your PCRs go warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold, and we can warm it up and not have to like worry about our DNA polymerase um, denaturing. So TAC polymerase basically revolutionized our ability to sequence DNA by allowing us to easily um, uh, uh, amplify small segments of DNA. And it, it's worth, when I say billions, I mean it's literally worth billions of dollars because almost any uh, segment of DNA that's ever been sequenced has used TAC polymerase. So, you know, wow, um, a couple of microbiologists wandering around Yellowstone in the 70s discovering a, a, a bacteria living in hot water, like revolutionized biotechnology. Okay. How global, Jen Hester, can you please explain how global climate change causes extreme weather events, not just warmer climate everywhere? You know, that's another fantastic question. Um, climate is the overall uh, average of weather. Weather is what we get day to day. Climate is, you know, I live in Albuquerque. It's going to be, you know, on any given day in June, it's going to be about 90, low 90s and the highs. And then the, the in the morning is going to be, you know, in the in the mid 60s. And uh, until the monsoons kick in, we have not much chance of rain. And then the monsoons will kick in in July and we have about a 20, 30 percent chance of rain every day. That's those those averages are climate. And what happens is as the climate gets warmer, what that means is, is we're adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. It's, it's a, it's like adding a blanket that's keeping in heat from the solar, you know, solar radiation. Now you start keeping in more heat, you got more energy. Now more energy means you get more energetic storms. So these hurricanes that have hit us lately, like Harvey, um, Sandy, um, Katrina. Here's the issue. The climate change may or may not have caused that individual storm to hit. We, we can't really say that. But what we can do is go, you know what? The northern Gulf of Mexico, where this storm rapidly intensified, was three degrees or five degrees above normal. And that added in X amount of energy, which spun these hurricanes up incredibly fast. So, yeah, the climate change clearly made these hurricanes worse. We're also seeing not just an uptick in, in bad hurricanes, but like thunderstorms and tornadoes. Um, you know, we're having longer times between thunderstorms, but when they hit, there's so much more energy in the atmosphere because it's warmer, you get a much more extreme event. Uh, climate change is also intensifying, like if you're wet, you get wetter. If you get dry, you get drier. And then my favorite is in the wintertime, 
you know, uh, a lot of climate deniers are like, oh, it's snowing. Uh, go, what about the stupid global climate change thing? The reality is uh, you can actually get really crazy weather because your polar vortex starts to um, wander and you get all this cold air dipping way far south and more south than it used to. And yeah, you know, it might be 50 degrees warmer in the Arctic, but 50 degrees warmer is still like zero degrees. You can put that down here in Albuquerque and that's cold. Okay. Can you explain the role of oxygen as a final electron acceptor? Why is this significant? Where does the oxygen come from? All right, good question. Oxygen in our atmosphere comes from photosynthesis, but in an animal or in a, like us, we're breathing it in. So oxygen, you know, gets in our lungs or we, we transport around and gets into our cells. So here it is. Oxidative phosphorylation requires an electron transport chain. Now the electrons come from the, uh, the organic molecules we break down. So if we're breaking down fat or glucose, those molecules have high energy electrons that we basically pull away from them. And then we use to power the electron transport chain, which pumps protons into the intermembrane space of the mitochondria. And that creates, of course, our electrochemical gradient that we use, or our cells use actually, mitochondria specifically, to make ATP through chemiosmosis. Now, as the electrons flow through the, the um, electron transport chain, they're losing energy, okay? And, you know, I said every cell on the planet does this. Well, other cells use, you know, other things besides oxygen, the electron acceptor, but they're not as electronegative, so the electrons don't fall as far in energy, so you don't get as much work out of them. However, with oxygen being the final electron acceptor, oxygen is the second most electronegative element in the universe. So as a result, it allows these electrons to fall way further down in energy. And when they fall way further down in energy, you get more work out of them. You pump more protons. You get a stronger electrochemical gradient. You make more ATP through chemiosmosis. So oxygen is a final electron acceptor in aerobic cellular respiration. It's complex four does that. And it jams those electrons onto the oxygen. And then oxygen, of course, picks up the protons flowing through ATP synthase and makes water. And this is one of the most brilliant things life has ever done because it, by using oxygen, you make way more ATP for every molecule of glucose. You're incredibly more efficient. And this paved the way for eukaryotic cells and multicellular life like you and me. Okay. Shayla, can you explain how energy coupling works to drive endergonic reactions? Okay. Unfortunately, I really wish I had my, my whiteboard, but like I said, my, my pen is, is dry after about two uses. Okay, here's how it works. An endergonic reaction, that's a positive delta G. That means that the products have more potential energy than the reactants. So if you think of like photosynthesis, carbon dioxide plus water, those reactants have very little potential energy. Carbohydrates and oxygen, way more potential energy. So you have to have a source of energy to make, you know, your glucose molecule, which also reduces entropy as well. So what our cells do is they will couple an endergonic reaction with an extragonic reaction. And a lot of times what they do is they use ATP. So what they do is they take ATP, it's got three phosphates on there, and they'll take one of those phosphates and stick it on an intermediate. And by adding a phosphate group to another molecule, you often increase the potential energy. So when you increase the potential energy of that molecule, it becomes much easier to break down, right? You can easier to break those bonds. So then when you go from that phosphorylated intermediate to your actual products, your overall reaction is actually an extragonic reaction. That's how you couple it. So you're, you're coupling often, you know, on a, Phosphorylating intermediate with ATP. Okay, good question. I'm gonna turn this down just a tad bit. Okay. Julie, how does the facilitated diffusion rate relate to this unit? I am also still confused about, you mean the electrochemical gradient? You, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, sure, absolutely. And in fact, you know, that's a fantastic question, you know, because Earlier in the semester, we learn about cellular transport, 
we learn about just simple diffusion where molecules like carbon dioxide, oxygen, and water can diffuse right through a membrane through their uh, down their um, concentration gradient. Uh, facilitated diffusion uh, are things like hydrophilic, larger hydrophilic molecules like um, proteins, amino acids, and ions do not cross membranes very well. So you have a protein embedded in that membrane that can either um, carry it through the membrane or it's like a, a tunnel, right? And you can have like an ion channel and those ion channels are often gated, which means you can turn them on and off. Now it'd be facilitated diffusion because the ions are still moving down their concentration gradient, but you have a protein that helps them out, hence facilitated diffusion. And of course, active transport is whenever you use a pump and a uh, source of energy to move a solute against its concentration gradient. So when we're talking about photosynthesis and cellular respiration, what happens here is the electron transport chain is using the energy of the electrons to actively pump protons across a membrane. Because I gather more protons on the other side of the membrane, these protons are positively charged, okay? So we have a gradient. We have a, a change in concentration of a substance over a very short distance. Now it's called an electrochemical gradient because the protons are charged positive, right? So the intermembrane space becomes positively charged relative to the matrix, which becomes negatively charged. That's an electrical gradient. It's, a, it's the exact same thing as your battery. You got a plus end and a minus end. Now on our, in our mitochondria, we got a plus side and a negative side. That's an electrical gradient. We also have a chemical gradient because I've got more protons on one side than the other, hence electrochemical gradient. Now, once you've created an electrochemical gradient, it's like water behind a dam. If there's water up there behind the dam, then uh, you've got stored energy. So electrochemical gradients store energy. Then what happens is we have facilitated diffusion, and we can use that to do work. Cells use it for all kinds of things. But when it comes to cellular respiration and photosynthesis, the light reaction, both of these rely on chemiosmosis. So the protons want to be in equilibrium. So what they're going to do is they can't, well, they can't cross the membrane. So they flow down their concentration gradient through ATP synthase. So ATP synthase facilitates their diffusion down their concentration gradient. But like water flowing through a dam, all the water molecules are moving in one direction. You can harness that to do work, like turn a turbine. In the case of chemiosmosis, that Chemiosmosis is actually facilitated diffusion. The protons are flowing through the ATP synthase, and they use that to do work to make ATP. Okay, I hope that um, I hope that helps out, Julie. Okay, can you explain how substrate level phosphorylation works again? Okay, so I've said this a couple times. Basically, what happens is with substrate level phosphorylation, you have a specific enzyme. And that enzyme is going to use energy from an exergonic reaction like the breakdown of a carbohydrate or a lipid. And what it's going to do is going to pair these two reactions together so that it can actually put a phosphate group onto ADP, forming ATP. And one thing about the substrate level phosphorylation is it requires 7.3 kilocalories a mole to make um, ATP. So what that means is you're your, your exergonic reaction better have more than 7.3 kilocalories a mole. You won't get any ATP at all. It's like I got a Mountain Dew, right? This thing costs a buck fifty. Well, I used to, they used to cost a dollar fifty. They're more expensive now. Um, if you put a dollar forty nine in your soda machine, you you won't get a Mountain Dew. You're sad. You know, you're just thirsty. Uh, substrate level phosphorylation is the same way, right? If you don't have 7.3 kilocalories a mole, you don't get any ATP. However, let's say you're really thirsty. You put a $5 bill in the soda machine. Uh, you get your Mountain Dew, but then it takes your change, right? So in substrate level phosphorylation, uh, if, if your exergonic reaction releases too much energy, yeah, you, get a, you get ATP, but you've lost the rest of your energy. Okay. Nate G, what's the difference between catabolic and anabolic reactions? You know, fantastic question. Let's start back. Let's take a step back. Every living organism has metabolism. Metabolism is a sum of all the chemical reactions in our body. And life uses energy to basically create order. And we create order through metabolic reactions. So organisms like you and me, 
we are heterotrophs, so we acquire all of our energy from the foods we eat. So our carbohydrates, our proteins, and our lipids, uh, these molecules have lots of potential energy in them, so we break them down. So whenever we break carbohydrates or fast down to carbon dioxide on water, we're breaking things down that's, that's catabolic reactions. If you're taking a protein and you, know, you go eat a steak, you, you, can't, um, you can't incorporate that steak protein directly in your muscles, right? So you have to break down all those proteins into the amino acids. So catabolic reactions are also hydrolysis reactions too, right? Breaking down polymers into monomers, breaking down um, car complex carbohydrates into glucose molecules or glucose molecules into carbon dioxide, breaking proteins down into amino acids. These are all catabolic reactions. On the flip side are anabolic reactions. And these are typically endergonic. And catabolic reactions, you take smaller molecules, I'm oh, sorry, and anabolic reactions, you take smaller molecules. So your reactants are smaller, more complex, and you build them into larger, more complex uh, molecules. So taking amino acids and building them into um, proteins would be an anabolic reaction. Or in photosynthesis, taking carbon dioxide and water and making a carbohydrate out of that would be an anabolic reaction. Okay. Ha, Jen, is organic food healthier than non-organic? Is GMO health is non-GMO healthier? Yeah, you know, I've been talking a lot about that in Bio 123. And the answer about is organic food healthier than non-organic? And as a, as a biologist, to me, that question is almost silly because, you know, all of our food is, of course, organic because it's built around carbon. But there is this idea of, like, eating organic. Um, is it healthier? Not really. Uh, it costs more. Um, and it looks different. But it's not healthier. And there's no data that actually shows that organic food is any healthier than non-organic. And, in fact, you should never not eat vegetables or fruits because you're worried that you can't afford the non-organic or afford the organic form. If you want to eat fruits and vegetables, go get fruits and vegetables. Don't worry about pesticide residues. Just you got to just wash it, rinse it off. And in fact, a lot of studies have come out and said that with the amount of herbicide residues on our food is, is not very much. It's uh, I'm probably doing more harm to myself drinking a beer or drinking Mountain Dew than I am from these pesticide residues. And also um, this idea that organic food doesn't use pesticides is also wrong. They do use pesticides. They also use pesticides that may not be as rigorously tested for your health as a non-organic food. So um, for me personally, I used to eat organic all the time. Uh, I, I, I feel duped after learning the truth behind it. Now I, I don't eat organic food. I eat non-organic or whatever is in front of me. I don't really care. Is non-GMO healthier? Oh man, the non-GMO project. It's, it's propaganda. Uh, GMO foods are just as healthy or healthier than the non-GMO ones. Uh, and in fact, not, uh, creating GMO foods is way, way, way more accurate and efficient than crossbreeding through artificial selection. And in fact, we have a lot of less um, off-target mutations and all GMO foods undergo very rigorous testing for their health and safety, more so than uh, other foods that are GMO. Uh, so there's no need to avoid uh, GMO foods. This whole non-GMO project is, is a bit ridiculous. And not only that, um, companies pay to put the non-GMO logo on their food products, even though there's not a GMO alternative. So you're paying for that logo, even though there's not even a GMO alternative. And uh, yeah, I could go on with that. Oh, Jen, again, also are these foods better for the environment? Uh, GMOs, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's a, it's counterintuitive. People demonize these large corporations like Monsanto and things like that. And uh, for me, yeah, I wouldn't demonize them at all. I mean, Monsanto did something really cool with uh, Roundup Ready Plants and Glyphosate. They've been completely demonized by it. But with 7.6 billion people on the planet to feed, we need all the technology we can to reduce water waste, to reduce the pesticides, to increase shelf life, and to uh, reduce fertilizer use because fertilizer use causes a lot of problems in our, in our waterways. So Monsanto did something really brilliant back in the 90s. They created Roundup Ready plants so you could go buy their crop, 
use uh, their herbicide on it that their crops are immune to. The herbicide was Roundup, which glyphosate is the um, the major ingredient. And when it comes to herbicides, it's one of the least toxic of all the uh, herbicides out there, one of them. And in fact, um, it's less toxic than the caffeine in my Mountain Dew, which means it would take um, more glyphosate to kill me than the than um, the caffeine, or more ca or less caffeine to kill me than it would glyphosate. And by by making their plants Roundup ready, now we can use less herbicide. And because uh, these these plants are now being herbicided and they're not being killed from it, we don't have to water all the weeds. And uh, that increased efficiency and it reduced fertilizer use. So their product was actually very helpful in terms of the economics behind it and solving our world's problems. But unfortunately, they they had become quite demonized. Okay. Okay, Nate G. Why does it take two cycles of the Krebs cycle to produce its products again? Yeah, that's a, I really wish I had my, uh, my thing to show you, but basically what happens is the Krebs cycle goes around twice and you start with a four carbon sugar called, or compound, not sugar, four carbon compound called oxalacetate. And oxalacetate has two carboxyl groups attached to it. And when you add on the acetyl group, you create another third carboxyl group and you get tricarboxylic acid, which is basically citric acid. But what happens is in the first round of the Krebs cycle, the two carbons that came in off of the acetyl aldehyde or the, the acetyl coenzyme A, they don't get oxidized to carbon dioxide. The, the carbons off the oxalacetate do. So then in the first like three or four steps, you produce your carbon dioxide, but then you regenerate those four carbon compounds back to oxalacetate. And then you add your, your acetyl coenzyme A on there again, or actually just your acetyl group actually. And then it goes round and round and round. So when you add those acetyl groups, they're not getting oxidized until the second round. Okay. Ah, Jen Hester, can you explain herd immunity and the importance of vaccinations? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, get your vaccinations. Wow, measles is on the rise. And in fact, we declared it gone from our country in 2000. And now we have already had more measles cases this year than we have had in any year since 2000, it was declared um, eradicated. And unfortunately, the saddest part of this, it was completely avoidable. It comes down to people exempting out of their vaccinations for personal reasons based on ideology and not understanding how vaccinations work or somehow thinking it causes autism. It does not. So here's how herd immunity works. Uh, there are people out there that cannot get vaccinated. They are either allergic to the vaccinations for various reasons, or they're immunosuppressed because they have HIV or they're having other types of diseases. And so they're very susceptible. And so are our children. And in fact, uh, I have friends that have kids that are under the age of two that won't bring them out because they haven't been through their full rounds of vaccination. So not getting vaccinated puts certain segments of our society at risk, especially our babies, the ones that uh, depend on us the most. So the way herd immunity works is um, the more people that get vaccinated, the more effective it becomes at the population level. So if I have, let's say, 99 people are vaccinated and one person isn't, that one person is really unlikely to get measles or whatever uh, disease it is. But as more and more people opt out, more and more people become susceptible to that disease. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And in fact, we're seeing groups of outbreaks where people have low rates of immunization because now once it gets in there, it's, easy, it's really easily spread amongst the population. And um, immunizations aren't 100 percent. You know, they, they, they're pretty high. I mean, it's up in the 90s for many of them. And as we get older, uh, those immunizations wear off. So we have to get booster shots every now and then. So I'm glad I had to go get all my booster shots. So, yeah, herd immunity. And when, like I said, when lots of people in our society aren't getting immunized, we lose that herd immunity, and then we really start to put our children at risk, and even the elderly, and some of us that have even been vaccinated. I mean, it's like your choice to not get vaccinated is actually causing great harm to our society and puts us all at risk. Okay. Let's see. Nate G., when does lactic acid fermentation kick in, and how does it produce 
less than amount of energy. Also, should we rehash the comparison between getting off the gray and the bow rocks? <laughs> yeah, for those of you that weren't in my uh, 201 class, I did ask, you know, what's the relationship between Gandalf Grey and the Balrogs? Not going to get into that here, but, you know, Lord of the Rings is great. And thank you, Jeff Bezos, because we are going to have a new Lord of the Ring TV show coming out on Amazon Prime in the next year or two. He spent a quarter billion dollars just to acquire the rights for that show. So looking forward to seeing more Balrogs and the Astari and hopefully uh, the Valinor in the future. But let's get back to lactic acid fermentation. Okay. When it comes to sailor respiration, uh, aerobic or sailor respiration, you need oxygen to make sure the pyruvate gets into the mitochondria so it can be broken down to carbon dioxide and we can extract all those high energy electrons, you know, to drive um, ATP production through chemical osmosis. However, if you're like a sprinter or a weightlifter, or you're putting a huge load on your muscles that can outstrip the rate at which sailor respiration can go, you go into what's called fermentation. And with lactic acid fermentation, if you're sprinting or weightlifting, uh, you're using ATP faster than aerobic respiration can keep up. But you still want to have some ATP production, and you want glycolysis to continue. So for glycolysis to continue, you must have a source of NADA+. This is your electron carrier. So during glycolysis, NAD+, is reduced to NADH. Lactic acid fermentation kicks in when you've run out of oxygen. And what lactic acid fermentation does is take NADH and oxidize it back to NAD. And then lactic acid, well, pyruvate is then um, reduced to lactic acid. And that's when it kicks in. Okay. And it produces a less amount of energy because, you know, you're only going to produce ATP through substrate level phosphorylation and you're not going to get hardly any through uh, chemin osmosis. Okay. Brian Weaver, can you review photorespiration and how it benefits plants? Haven't talked about that yet, but basically in photorespiration, what happens is plants uh, evolve, or let me go back to the beginning. Photosynthesis evolved billions of years ago before there was ever oxygen in the atmosphere. And there's an enzyme that's involved in the Calvin cycle that replenishes it. And that enzyme is called um, rubisco. It's a ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase. And what rubisco does is takes carbon dioxide and sticks it onto ribulose bisphosphate, R-U-B-P. That's a five-carbon sugar. And so it's going to take a carbon dioxide and jam it onto this five-carbon compound, and it's going to immediately split into two, three-carbon compounds. Okay. So photorespiration occurs when plants get water stress. So if it's dry outside and really hot, uh, the, the plants don't want to keep losing all their water to the outside environment. So what they do is they close down these small openings on the underside of the leaves called the stomata. They're going to close them. And what's going to happen is photosynthesis is going to keep going for a bit, but eventually um, rubisco is going to draw down the levels of carbon dioxide to a certain level where they get so low that it will eventually start sticking oxygen onto our onto ribulose bisphosphate onto RUBP. This is when photorespiration kicks in, and instead of adding uh, a carbon to it, we're going to start oxidizing with carbon. I mean, with oxygen, and uh, basically this actually starts costing the plant energy. However, we think it's also beneficial to the plant. Uh, in various ways because it prevents uh, the breakdown of other molecules and prevents damage to the leaf. And I'll talk more about that on Tuesday. Angelica, if we evolve from monkeys, why are monkeys still around? You know, <laughs> as a biologist, we often get this question quite a bit. Let me go way back. I mean, um, we actually all evolved from fish. And in fact, there's one of my favorite books you can watch it on television. It's called um, Your Inner Fish by Neil Shubin. If you go back uh, 375 million years ago, our ancestors were just learning to crawl on land. And uh, so we actually are modified fish. I know it's really crazy, uh, but we still have like our, our gills um, and, and these get part, turned into part of our ear bone and part of our neck. Uh, we still have a dorsal nerve cord and a spine cord, just like fish do. We have paired appendages. These are you know, our pecs, pectoral fins, pelvic fins on fish. 
So, you know, we have a head with all of our eyes, mouth, and everything on it. Okay. Going along, you know, mammals evolve. So all mammals have, you know, uh, hair. We're endothermic, which means we're producer in body heat. We have live birth because we inherited that from a common ancestor. And then we have primates. And primates, we have fingernails, right? We have these things called fingernails. We've got nice fingers. We can grab. We've got forward-facing eyes for depth perception. So sometime around five to seven million years ago, there were some primates living in Africa that were starting to walk upright and coming down out of the trees. And uh, at some point, they speciated into two different species. And um, well, actually, the ancestors to all of humans, there were lots of ancestors to human species. And then their ones went off and evolved into chimpanzees. And if you go back far enough, we're related to orangutans and, and, uh, and um, apes. And if you go back even far enough to monkeys, and monkeys, of course, are very different from the from they're still primates, but we probably haven't shared a common ancestor with monkeys in gosh, 40 million years. But it's like uh, the thing is with, with monkeys is well, monkeys went off and evolved to go be a macaw, they went off to go evolve to be a baboon, they went off to evolve to be a chimpanzee. Whereas humans started walking upright, we developed uh, sociality, we developed language, and as a result of these things, we got this enormous noggin up here. And we evolved into a, a much more complex species, at least socially, than chimpanzees did. So they've been doing their own thing. And just like, you know, we evolved from um, fish 375 million years ago. Well, guess what? Uh, there's still plenty of fish. There's like 30,000 species of fish. They've been doing their own thing as well. Okay. If I were given the opportunity to go into space, would I go? Oh, man, that's, that's hard. With our current technology, hell no. Um, you're, you're, you're put on a rocket ship with the largest, like barely controlled oxidation reaction you can possibly imagine. I mean, you're like burning liquid hydrogen and reacting that with oxygen and some other stuff in there. And I mean, it's like a controlled explosion to hurl you seven and a half miles per second into the, out of the earth. And, uh, yeah, no thanks. Um, to the, all the astronauts, you're tough. You're, you're braver than I am. The fail rate is higher than I want to. I want to go for it. Now, you reduce that failure rate. You reduce the rate at which people die going into space. And, yeah, you make it as safe as me driving to the – um, hopping on an airplane and, and flying back home to Florida or getting into my car and driving into the university. Then I'll be – I would love to go. I mean, I, I, I wish we had, like, Star Wars or something, you know, or we could – or the Orville or it was really safe to go out into space. But right now, it's uh, – it's pretty scary getting in out there. So I'll stay on the ground as much as I love astronomy and, and think about space-based sci-fi all the time. I'm going to, I'm going to stay right here. Just make it safer for me because I really, really, really want to explore the universe so bad. Okay. Dark tennis ball. How do I remember all this? <laughs> you know, I have an average memory, believe it or not. I mean, I've been in school since like 1992 uh, undergraduate, then I, I, I went to graduate school for eight years, and I've been teaching it for 10. And, the, you know, one of the ways I remember that is I think uh, top down, I go with, like, what's a big picture first? I have to study just like everybody else does. And the fact that with, like, cellular respiration or photosynthesis, I've taught this for 15 years. The first time I learned it, I walked out of class going, what? I had the deer in the headlight look like, what in the world did I just learn? But it took like a lot of active learning, engagement, uh, teaching my friends, working practice problems, and immersing myself in the material. And eventually, I learned a lot of these materials. And and the other thing also is, um, I think it's easy to learn things when you're interested, and when you're not interested, it's it's hard. And trust me, I I know I I've, I've tried to learn things that is hard, that I'm not interested, and I don't do very well. Okay, Jen. Okay, what if the population, so what causes the population of silvery men to plummet? What could be done to recover that fish? And what other kinds of implications does that low number of species have? Oh, you know, that's, if you're not familiar with it, we live out here in the Southwest and we have a river running through Albuquerque called the Rio Grande River. And it's got an endangered fish in it called the silvery minnow. And it's, it's kind of a nondescript fish, about yay big, it's silvery, looks like a minnow. But what's interesting about this fish is that they spawn right now during the spring and they release all of their eggs and the eggs float down the river and they have to reach the right habitat. And they're called pelagic spawners. 
And believe it or not, pelagic spawning fish and freshwater ecosystems are amongst the most abundant and important source of fishes for many fisheries in the world. And what's caused the population of the silver minnow to plummet is lots of dams on the river. And uh, if, if I got a video where I show the Rio Grande going dry, you know, these fish can't survive in a dry riverbed. So they, they, they die. And uh, because we have dams and we got lakes, when the eggs, if the eggs get to the lakes, they, um, they die. They can't survive in lakes. So there's been a lot to the low numbers. The implications for that is whenever species reach low numbers, um, bad things can start to happen quickly to that population. You know, every population has genetic variability. I mean, just think of our classes, you know, people, the multiple different types of skin color, uh, hair color, eye color, likes, interests, weight, strengths. You know, some people are very musical. Some people are very athletic. Some people are strong. Some people are long distance runners. Some people love science. Some people are good at music. Some people are good at languages. That is based a lot on genetic variability. When populations get low, you tend to randomly lose genetic variability. So imagine, you know, like all of a sudden all humans lost all their genetic variability and everybody all of a sudden had like A blood and then a disease hit that hit everybody's A blood. And if you had B, you're immune, but there's no more B blood. So what happens was with uh, these low, low numbers, is they start losing genetic variability, which makes them susceptible to inbreeding. They have less... With the less variability, they're less able to adapt to the environment. And they can potentially even accumulate a bunch of negative or deleterious alleles that could uh, make the entire population less fit. And it's just like a, it's just like a ratchet. It just keeps ratcheting down and down and down and down. And gets worse and worse and worse until they go extinct. Okay. Uh, time for a Mountain Dew break. Okay, Nate G. How is glycolysis regulated? And could I go back over aerobic cell boring into another cell to form mitochondria and eukaryotes as we know them today? Okay, so two questions. Let's talk about glycolysis. So there are 10 chemical reactions to glycolysis. Each one is caused by a enzyme that facilitates a chemical reaction. So basically, um, the first three steps. By the third step is when you form 1,6-phosphofructose, uh, um, where you, you you basically stick a second phosphate onto uh, your fructose molecule. Yeah, I know I said fructose because you convert glucose to fructose in step number two. Okay, now glycolysis, you know, it leads into uh, uh, pyruvid oxidation, which leads into Krebs cycle, which leads into, you know, oxidative phosphorylation. All of these make ATP. Well, believe it or not, you don't want a ton of ATP in your cells because it's very reactive. So if you have a lot of, if this was a regular diet, so a regular soda, lots of sugar, what would happen is it would start, you know, going through glycolysis and start making all this ATP, but you don't want it. So the way glycolysis is regulated is in step number three, ATP will bind to that enzyme that adds that second phosphate group to the fructokine, to the phosphate fructose. And what it does is when you phosphorylate or when you start getting ATP binding to that enzyme, it changes the active site and it basically stops glycolysis, right? So if you build up a lot of ATP, you stop, you slow down or stop glycolysis and you actually take the glucose molecules and you go into different pathways, including making uh, fatty acids out of them. Okay. Now, the next one is aerobic cell boring into another form of mitochondria. Okay, so what we're talking about is the origin of eukaryotes through a process called endosymbiosis. Endosymbiosis occurred like 2 billion years ago, and almost every place on the web gets this wrong. I even have a, a Mythbusters on there where I, I said, you know, this is a proto-eukaryotic cell did not um, engulf a... Uh, a bacteria. What happened was you had two prokaryotes, an archaean and a bacteria, and the bacteria was capable of aerobic respiration and almost certainly bored into the archaean. And at first was probably a parasitic relationship, but over time, that aerobically respiring bacteria evolved a much more mutualistic relationship. And as a result, 
it, uh, it eventually went on to form mitochondria. Now, as cells get larger and larger and larger and larger, prokaryotic cells, they run out of energy because they make ATP across their outer membrane. But by adding mitochondria into your cells, you can get just more and more and more mitochondria, allowing your cells to get larger and more and more complex. So that led to the largest restructuring, you know, in like two billion years of history of, of cells. And that's how we got eukaryotic cells, because you can have lots and lots of mitochondria in there. Okay. Jen, can you explain the relationship between birds and dinosaurs and why people are saying that some dinosaurs, maybe the majority actually had feathers? Oh, that's a good question. Okay. The ex generally accepted view of birds is that they evolved from a theropod dinosaur. Now, dinosaurs actually had um, two major lineages. You had the bird hit dinosaurs called the ornithosaurians, orny meaning bird. And then you also had um, the lizard hip, the saurischian dinosaurs. And uh, I learned that birds came from the saurischian dinosaurs, and now they're moving them over to the ornithosaurian dinosaurs. But the point is, is that we think that birds evolved from dinosaurs. And interestingly, we think that feathers may have come along uh, before birds evolved, and that dinosaurs were using feathers either for display or to keep warm. And because feathers are basically modified um, scales, and now that they've got these feathers that they were using either for warmth or display, serendipitously, they could be now used for flight. Now, that's a generally accepted uh, dinosaur, bird dinosaur um, uh, view, but uh, there is some controversy out there. There are some people out there that think that the link between birds and dinosaurs is not as well established as everybody says it is. A lot of people are just like on the bandwagon saying, oh, yeah, yeah, birds are dinosaurs, birds are dinosaurs. And there are other people that have said, like Fran James, that wait one second, um, you know, birds are maybe closely related to dinosaurs and that feathers is actually a, uh, a condition of being a bird. And so all these like, Dinosaurs we see that with feathers may actually have been um, actually bird lineage. We'll see. We'll, we'll see where this comes out at. Okay. Kyle, can you explain the process of CRISPR technology and how it's safe? Okay, so CRISPR is really cool. Uh, once again, this is why we need basic science, right? So CRISPR is was, the, was found in bacteria, and basically – it's a bacterial immune system. So they incorporate parts of a virus into their genome. And whenever they recognize that viral genome, they can use that, that DNA to recognize it. They'll, they'll get these proteins with it. They'll find virus DNA and cut it up. What we can basically do now is we can, we can program these scissors to cut any specific piece of DNA we want. And uh, the reason why we know it's safe is because it's, it's highly specific to very certain segments of DNA. Now, that being said, there are often off-target mutations, and you test for those, and we can actually test very easily for any off-target mutations. Uh, we are discovering, however, that um, when we start trying to modify cells in our body, that our body wants to return them back to normal, and that can lead to some issues that we're still working out. But when it comes to making GMOs, CRISPR technology is absolutely safe. Like I said, we can target it very specifically as the most precise editing we've ever had. And then once we make the edits, we go out and we test it. And that is the important part. you got to test everything you make just to make sure it's safe. Okay. Jen, I was also wondering what silverman is low abundance or complete loss in the middle of Rio Grande would do for other species in the river or the plants or any parts of the river system, insects, plants, et cetera. The, the, the answer is I don't – I actually don't know. Uh, if we lost a silvery minnow – we would lose diversity on the river and that could affect uh, their food source. You know, that they could be released, whatever they were eating, but then other fish may also um, change their abundances to, uh, to become either more or less abundant, depending on their relationships with the silver minnow. And the reality is like, you know, the, the Rio Grande doesn't have a lot of fish in it. I mean, they're fish, but losing one, I know it'll, it'll, it'll cause definitely a loss, but in terms of like, the rest of the ecosystem? I, I don't really know, actually. That's a good question. You stumped me on that one. Okay. Nate G. 
How did alcoholic fermentation lead to the agricultural revolution? <laughs> I love that question. That's a good test question, actually. Um, you know, humans are like 200,000 years old as a species, but it's only the last 10,000 that we settled down and started growing crops. And there's a lot of speculation as to why we did that. And one of them is, well, you know, finally we had some stable weather for the first time as we entered the Holocene and the last major glaciation ended and the climate stabilized, allowing us to predict when we could actually plant. So the, the, the simplest answer is, well, you know, we, we started planting so we could have seeds and we could have crops and foods, you know, through the winter. But it turns out that we think that um, the first agriculture was actually to grow uh, wheat and other things for like beer, wine, and mead. And the reason why is because, well, you tell me, I mean, how many of you have actually met like your best friend, your new best friend over a couple beers? What before humans settled down in the form communities, we were mostly nomadic. So seeing another group of people could be bad, whereas alcohol broke down those social norms and allowed people to interact with each other. Also, alcohol, uh, like having beer, which is like, you know, two to three percent beer, uh, alcohol in the beer reduced your risk of getting waterborne diseases as well. So it provided social lubrication and it was also safer to drink. And then when you think after that, then they started growing crops for like to store for food. Okay. Would I be willing to give a shout out to some of my most important mentors in science and a brief description of why they are important to you in their research and awesome teaching skills? Yeah. Uh, you know, Tom Turner at UNM, you know, he was definitely, he was my PhD advisor. He was incredibly important. Um, you know, really taught me how to be a good scientist. Fran James at Florida State, you know, gave me my first break as a, you know, as just some young kid in her class. And she's like, yeah, I need somebody to go check out some woodpeckers. And I was like, I can do that. And uh, so she was a big mentor. I'm a, you know, the, my friend, one of my best friends, Michael Collins, uh, man, you guys, he's in his walking encyclopedia. Whenever I have a problem or a question, I usually go to my friend, Michael Collins, who was my TA uh, in class like 25 years ago. We're still best friends. And he was a major mentor as well. Okay. Oh, Ruby, why do you teach that sea sponges are plants, but is generally accepted to be an animal? Okay, clarification. Uh, sponges are clearly not plants. I, 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 if I said they were plants, I'm sorry. Um, I miscommunicated. They are not plants. They are clearly related to animals. So um, whenever I teach... Um, 204, which is not the 304, I talk about what makes an animal an animal. So for me, an animal is a multicellular organism that has true germ layers. So I've got an endoderm and or an, an ectoderm that, you know, things like nadarians, like jellyfish have endoderm and ectoderm. And we also have a mesoderm, which is our middle germ layer. And from that, like all of our organs originate from that. We also have symmetry. Uh, a jellyfish has radial symmetry, so it could be a circle. And you could cut it either side, but you have symmetry. You and I, we've got bilateral symmetry. There's a left and a right side. I've got a head and a back end. So, to, and also all animals have a, um, a nervous system that coordinates muscle for movement. And we feed by ingestion. We all, animals have a mouth. There are exceptions where they've lost their mouth over evolutionary time, as in a lot of parasitic worms. They've lost their mouth. They can absorb everything through their cuticle. Okay. So because I think that animals, the, the line is the, um, the symmetry, the true germ layers, uh, the feeding by ingestion, I mean, or at least your ancestor did. And then having muscles coordinated by a nervous system to me is just absolutely makes an animal an animal. Whereas sponges, um, yeah, they don't have that. They have specialized cells. We have specialized cells, but they, they lack symmetry. They lack muscle and nervous system, and uh, they lack a true germ layers. So for me, I really think that sponges are sister to animals, but aren't really an animal. Unless, of course, um, I'm going to make it complicated here. They're degenerate animals, meaning that they had all those features and then lost them over evolutionary time. But I don't think that's the case. I think that they're just very primitive, early versions of what was going to become an animal because they lacked those, those, uh, those features. Good question. Okay, what did my uh, mentors do that inspired me? 
Oh, that's a good question. You know, going back to Florida State, you know, like Fran James, she really inspired me because she really was into conservation and she showed me how science can be applied to conservation. And uh, Tom Turner, you know, one thing that he really does well is he combines, you know, genetics and ecology and, and, and uh, really brings those two fields together and the evolution part as well. And, uh, you know, Tom is always like, he was such a great mentor. He's really laid back, hardworking, and he's very question driven. He just reminds me all the time to like, you know, ask those questions and keep pushing that science forward. Okay, Kyle, can you explain why the DNA taken from a fish doesn't make a tomato taste like a fish, etc.? That's a really good question. All right, this will be my last question tonight too. I got to go watch some Game of Thrones after this. But Kyle, that's a great question. Basically, what makes a fish smell fishy? is uh i just forgot it there's actually a um there's a couple proteins that give it that kind of smell and that slimy smell so if i take dna from a fish i mean what we're usually doing is taking some um chemical that doesn't allow the fish to freeze and putting it into a tomato or a strawberry and that chemical doesn't have a fishy taste or fishy smell to it so excuse me it won't make it taste like a fish or smell like a fish okay all right. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining in, and I will see you in class on well, Monday or Tuesday.